are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, ready to take you through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. I want to thank all of you for making this show your first listen of the day, whether you're new to my content, new to the show in general, new to Gonzaga basketball, whatever it may be. I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to listen and also check this show out on YouTube. If you have not already, head to YouTube, search Locked on Zags, hit that subscribe button, trying to get to 200 subscribers by the time Gonzaga takes on Duke on Friday. But before we get to that Duke game, We have a heck of a basketball game to talk about. Gonzaga laid waste to the number two team in the country, the UCLA Bruins. It was a battle for the ages, number one versus number two. First time the top two teams played each other, and both teams were from the West Coast. Dickie V returning from a cancer diagnosis less than six weeks ago to call the game. That's how big of a deal this basketball game was Dickie V's in the house. Everybody floods to Las Vegas and Gonzaga blows the doors off of Mick Cronin's UCLA squad. It was a, such a blast of a game to watch. I know that casual con- basketball fans, college basketball fans, were probably hoping for a closer game. I know there are some Gonzaga fans who maybe uh, yawn after seeing a lot of blowouts every season, and I understand that. But I got to tell you, I'm I'm pretty happy that this game went the way that it did. It's it's very fun to definitively prove how much better you are than other teams. And UCLA has some excuses, some of them legitimate, some of them not so legitimate. But at the end of the day, Gonzaga won this game by 20 points. They were up 20 at halftime. They did not let UCLA's attempts at runs affect them in the second half. They did not let imbalanced officiating in the second half affect them in any way, shape, or form. They still won this game by 20, an absolute masterclass of a performance. Today in the first segment, we're just going to react to this game. We're going to talk about the good and the bad, which is a very quick part of this podcast. Not a lot of negative things to discuss from this game. Second segment, we're looking at my five keys that I laid out in yesterday's podcast, depending when you're listening to this, Tuesday's podcast, talking about what I'm going to be watching for in this game. We're going to talk about how those things went and how they may impact Gonzaga for future games. And then third segment, it is Wednesday after all. We're doing WCC Wednesday. It's been a ridiculously good week For the West Coast Conference in general, St. Mary's took care of Oregon right before Gonzaga took care of UCLA, BYU's on a roll, Santa Clara looks like a tournament team. We're going to talk about all of that in a jam-packed third segment covering the WCC. But let's not not get ahead of ourselves. Let's not move past this UCLA game. I think we all want to talk about this for a little bit. We want to sit with this game because, man, oh, man, was that fun. Gonzaga did, and I hate to bring this up when we're having fun, y'all. I'm sorry. But Gonzaga did a little bit to UCLA what Baylor did to Gonzaga in the national championship. They just blew the doors off them right away and then just withstood, just refused to let the team come all the way back. You can tell that part of Mark Few's kind of game plan this season and part of what Gonzaga has done, they did it here, they did it against Texas. Hopefully they will find success trying to do this against Duke is just to, to get after it early. Don't wait to get into your offensive flow. Don't wait to get into a rhythm. Don't let the game come to you. Go attack early. Go get your shots early. Go play aggressive defense early. And it it almost looked like UCLA wasn't expecting that, maybe because that's not what Gonzaga did last year against this team. I'm not exactly sure. UCLA, UCLA was a little bit timid. They were afraid to go around the rim. They were they didn't take a lot of outside shots. I know that they had some health issues. I know that they were missing one of their key players, Cody Riley, a big man for that team. But They looked like they were constantly on the defensive, whereas Gonzaga came out with an onslaught right away. The good for this game, the number one thing, this was the best game of Andrew Nembhard's Gonzaga career. I have not watched every game that he played at Florida. I know this is not his career high in points, but I'd be surprised considering the stakes of this game if this was not the best game of Andrew Nembhard's collegiate career. 24 points, 6 assists, 5 rebounds, 3 assists. If you're into statistics, if you're into video, there's a whole bunch of super fun clips you can watch of him putting Johnny Juzang and Jaime Yaquez on skates throughout the game. His his handles were ridiculous. He was crossing people up. 
His confidence was through the roof. He had Gonzaga's first five points in this one on a lay-in and a three-pointer. He was far and away the most impressive player on the floor. We'll talk about Chad Holmgren. We'll talk about Drew Timmy. We'll talk about all those guys. They had great games as they usually do. But considering what Andrew Nemhart has done so far this season offensively, for him to break out in this kind of way, put up 24 points against a UCLA team that has deep, talented backcourt. Johnny Juzang, Jaime Yaquez, Tiger Campbell, they have a really good group of guards. And, Gens- and Nemhard was not afraid of them. He did not shy away from going right at them. He did not shy away from playing really good defense. He started the game out on Johnny Juzang. He was the guy guarding him. I mentioned that as a possibility before we got to this game, but it wasn't my preferred option. I kind of thought Nemhard would be relegated to guarding Tiger Campbell just because he's not a great defensive player, but he was up to the task today. He was in Juzang's grill. He was aggressive on that end of the floor. Like I said, he had three steals, which is fantastic for him. Just an all around outstanding performance. It cannot be stated enough how important Andrew Nemhard was for this game, how important he is to this team. Nolan Hickman's looked great as a backup point guard. Ros Bolton has played point guard at the collegiate level, but trust me, Andrew Nemhart is a critical, critical piece of what this team does on both ends of the floor. Speaking of both ends of the floor, Chet Holmgren had one of the best plays of probably the college basketball season, certainly of Gonzaga's season, when he blocked a shot by Miles Johnson at the rim, grabbed the rebound, drove down the court, went behind the back, crossed Miles Johnson up at the three-point line, took one more dribble, took off from inside the free throw line, and punched it with two hands. An incredible play. I thought Dickie V was going to lose his mind completely (laughs) in the booth, as you would expect him to do. He's a highly energetic man. That play set him off. It was an incredible sequence of events. It's what we know Chet Holmgren is capable of doing. We saw him do this in exhibition games. Those of us who've been watching his high school highlights for years have seen him do it a whole bunch of times. It's not new to us. It's new to the nation Most of them saw it for the very first time tonight. He did it against a good UCLA team, a good player in Miles Johnson. For him to make that kind of play was incredible. Finished with 15.6 boards, four blocks, six of eight shooting. He was was four for four from inside the paint, two for four from three. An incredible game for Chet Holmgren. Hyper-efficient as he has been throughout the season. He's one of the most efficient scorers in college basketball, continuing a trend where Gonzaga has had some of the most efficient scores in college basketball for many of the last couple of years with Drew Timmy, of course, and then Brandon Clark before that, DeMontis Savonis before that. They've continued to have hyper-efficient players at finishing around the rim. Chet Holmgren is a different breed because of his ability to also shoot from the outside and because of his ability to be an elite, elite rim protector. It was a fantastic game for him. These last couple games as he's become more confident offensively, you know, we talked about the Texas game quite a bit, how his performance was a bit overblown and how concerned people should be because he only had 2.5 boards. I know there was kind of some consternation about that, but he wasn't really looking for a shot now in these games. He's still letting the game come to him, which is an incredibly difficult skill for a any freshman who's been the, the best player on their team. And if you're on Gonzaga's roster, you were the best player on your high school team. It's hard for anybody to adjust to that, but for the number one recruit in the country, a consensus top three pick in the draft, to be able to let the game come to him, to not worry about getting his touches, getting his shots, is an incredible, just high level of emotional IQ, a basketball IQ, just and, and a lot of intelligence around the game of basketball for him. And you can see how it pays off when he doesn't necessarily look for his shots, but he finds ways to get open. He gets out in, in transition better than any big man in the country of his size. Just an incredible basketball player. And I was so happy to see him do this against UCLA because he didn't pop in the way that a lot of people would have liked to see him do against Texas. But now he's got a big game under his belt. He did exactly what you could have asked for him and more. Truly incredible performance from Chet Holmgren. Uh, My third point, Gonzaga is the best defensive team in the country. They are one of the best defensive basketball teams I have ever seen. It is incredible to watch this team play defense. This has not been a strength of Mark Few's for the majority of his time as the head coach. They're usually not a bad defensive team, but they're usually more offense than defense. That has been changing the last couple of years. This year, it's in full force how good of a defensive team this Gonzaga Bulldogs roster is. They held UCLA to 35% shooting. UCLA took 69 shots. They only made 24 of them. This is a team that was one of the most efficient scoring teams in the country coming in tonight. And yes, part of it was that they just weren't knocking down shots they normally make. Part of it was not having Cody Riley, but that's a small part. The rest of it was Gonzaga contesting shots 
in a way that UCLA has not faced all season long. UCLA was straight up afraid to go all the way into the paint when Chet Holmgren was in the game. Now, this is a team, and many of you will remember this if you watched the Final Four game last year, this is a team that relies on the mid-range more than most other teams in the country. That's, A, not an incredibly efficient way to have an offense, and you can see why after watching this game. But they, more so than usual, they got open around the basket. They beat their men. They got close to the hoop, and then Chet was down there ready to pounce, ready to get up and block a shot, and you'd see them spin away, take fadeaways, take a step back, do whatever they could to not get their shot blocked by Chet. And it resulted in really, really poor shooting. I was fascinated by the fact that they seemed to have the strategy of not trying to go at the basket, but they also only took 12 threes. Why would you? <laughs> I don't understand. Like, I get that this is just the way that they run their offense, but it was baffling to me to see them be so afraid of getting right to the rim, but not willing to shoot threes. So you're settling on the least efficient shot in all of basketball. And the end result was they scored, you know, barely 60 points and got beat in the first five minutes of the game, basically. We're talking about, again, another point here. They, they only took 12 threes. They made two of them. That's 16.7%. This team was shooting over 50% from three coming into the game. Obviously, that was there was going to be some regression there anyway, but this is an incredible amount of regression. This poor team, they just could not knock anything down. Gonzaga's length on the perimeter, you know, guys like Hunter Salas, Anton Watson, they may have not had great games that pop on the box score. Neither of them played a ton of minutes, but their ability to get out in those situations, close out on guys quickly. We saw good defensive performance from Ros Bolton. I thought Julian Strother had a great defensive game as well. Obviously, Chet Holmgren is just incomparable on the defensive end of the floor. So just truly great stuff from this team all across the defensive side of the, of the floor. Uh, the bad stuff, really quick, Anton Watson didn't have a great night. Uh, I've been kind of hyping him up this week. It's like this is going to be a huge week for him. He was great in the first game against Central Michigan. He didn't do much here. Two boards, one turnover, four fouls. That's it. A couple of them were kind of cheap. I didn't think the officiating was great in this game. That's my second bad thing. At one point, the refs in the second half were 9 nothing for fouls on Gonzaga and fouls on UCLA. That's not great. That's bad officiating. It happens. It didn't impact Gonzaga in a serious way. It impacted Anton Watson. He had a forgettable night. It allowed Caden Perry to play some minutes that I don't think he would have otherwise played. We did not see Ben Gregg at all. We barely saw Hunter Salas and Nolan Hickman. We didn't see any of the walk-ons or Martinez or Lauskas or any of those guys. So I think Caden Perry was kind of an emergency because of the foul trouble that Chet Holmgren and Anton Watson had. Cool for him to get that experience. You know, I think it's always valuable to get that opportunity to play in big games like this. He looked fine. He didn't do a whole lot, but that's okay. He didn't come into the game to, to do a whole lot. He grabbed some rebounds. He generally looked like he was ready to do whatever he needed to do. So I thought that was a solid performance from him, but a bit of a bummer from Anton Watson in this one. All right, that's, that's, that's as much bad news as I can say about this game. It was a fun game from start to finish. I'm still reeling from it, as I'm sure many of you are, regardless of when you're listening to it. This is a game that's going to take a few days to come all the way down from. And we're not done talking about it. We're going to come back in the second segment. We're going to talk all about the five things that I laid out to watch in this game. And we're going to talk about how they went, how they're going to go for future games potentially as well. Before we get there, though, let's talk about prize picks. All right, college football fanatics, have you heard about Prize Picks? Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. I love this app, and I know that you will too. Prize Picks is a leader in college sports daily fantasy. They offer more college football props than anyone in the world and offer all the all star players from not only the Power Five schools, but from your favorite mid major programs as well. New users that deposit and use the promo code Locked On will receive a 100% instant deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks allows mixed sport entries. So you can take the over on Chet Holmgren combined with the under on Patrick Mahomes in the same entry. Use the award-winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com and use promo code Locked On, or go to your App Store and download the app today. PrizePix is daily fantasy made easy. All right. Second segment, still talking Gonzaga UCLA, because how can we not still be talking Gonzaga UCLA? An incredibly fun game of basketball if you are not a UCLA fan. If you're a UCLA fan, not a fun game. Everybody else, pretty pretty darn fun game. I know it wasn't as close as some of the other pundits may have wanted it to be, but hey, I, I don't mind seeing a team dominate from start to finish, especially when they're playing the number two ranked team in the country. How about that? So here, second segment, we're going to talk about the five things that I laid out before the game that I was going to be watching for closely. Some of them ended up not mattering all that much because 
Like I said, we were expecting a much closer result uh, in the box score that we ended up getting the first one. How does Gonzaga defend Johnny Juzang? So like I mentioned in the first segment, Andrew Nembhard drew the assignment to guard him initially, but Gonzaga's highly switchable on defense and, and UCLA was trying to exploit that. So really everybody kind of got a crack at guarding Johnny Juzang throughout this game. He didn't have a great night. He scored 11 points. I uh, come into the game, he was averaging 21 and a half points. So about half of his points per game average is what he scored here. Uh, he shot five for 11 from the field, only one for three from three. Um, just not a great night for Johnny Juzang. I think not a great night for UCLA's offense as a whole. I thought Juzang was attempting to get to his spot. There was a few times when Gonzaga lost him on defense and he knocked down shots because of that. But for the most part, they were highly switchable. Everybody was kind of up to the task. Juzang's best skills as a basketball player are getting to his spots, and he struggled to do that. Chet Holmgren's presence down low had a big, big part to do with that in a lot of ways, although Juzang still likes to shoot in the mid-range. I think Chet's presence made him feel like he had to be a little bit farther away from the rim, and the results speak for themselves. You know, 11 points is, is I believe, a season low for him. If not, uh, it's obviously half of what he's averaging on the year, so clearly not, not the best offensive game for him. Number two, how does UCLA attempt to defend Drew Timmy and Chet Holmgren? You're not well. <laughs> not well is the answer to start the game. Jules Bernard was on Chet Holmgren. Miles Johnson, their big fellow, was on Drew Timmy. Uh, Timmy struggled a little bit out of the shoots. I think he only had three points in the first half. So it worked a little bit in that regard. But by the end of the day, those two guys combined for 33 points on 12 of 20 shooting. Hyper-efficient night for the two of them. Drew finished with 18. Chet had 15 it didn't work. Their strategy didn't work. And nobody has really figured it out. Chet had one game where he only scored two points. And that was not because Texas was guarding him well. It's because they were not guarding Drew Timmy at all. So Drew Timmy had 37 points in that one. So that game, Drew and Chet combined for 39 points. This, they combined for 33 points. So you could almost argue that UCLA did even better than Texas did. But either way, these two guys are absolute menaces. Nobody has seemed to find an effective way to stop them. We didn't see UCLA run the zone. I thought there was a possibility they would try to do that to force Gonzaga to shoot from the outside. Wasn't a strategy they ended up uh, deciding to go with. And that's probably a good thing because number three on my list, will Gonzaga's hot shooting continue? Yep, it sure will. Gonzaga went nine for 23 from the three-point line. That is good for 39.1%, 40% shooting basically from beyond the arc for a team that many people, myself included, were very concerned about the team's lack of experienced outside shooters. That has not been an issue so far this season. Andrew Nembhard has stepped up and become a considerably better three-point shooter than he had been in his career in Florida and than he was in a Gonzaga uniform last year. Roz Bolton has taken the jump that we expected him to do after one year at Penn State, two years at Iowa State, where he wasn't a great three-point shooter. We thought maybe being in a role where he's not asked to be the primary ball handler and the best offensive player on his team might allow him to shoot better from beyond the arc. That has been the case. Julian Strother knocked down a couple threes in this game as well. Nolan Hickman hit a three. Really nice performance from Gonzaga shooting from beyond the arc. Next up, speaking of Nolan Hickman, how do the freshman guards look against real competition? This is one of the ones that ultimately didn't really come to fruition. They just didn't play a whole lot. Nolan Hickman hit a three. Looked great there, but that was it. It was the only points that either of these two guys had. Uh, Hunter South had a couple of rebounds. Uh, played some really, really good defense, like stuff that's not going to show up in the stat sheet, but he looked excellent on that end of the floor, but they just didn't play a lot. Andrew Nembhard played a ton of minutes in this one. Rasir Bolton played a ton of minutes in this one. It's kind of what you'd expect from Mark Few to play these guys a lot of minutes. They got a couple days off before the Duke game on Friday. Might as well exhaust these guys. I thought you know maybe we'd see more of those guys in the last four or five minutes of the game, but UCLA was never given up. They were they kind of kept chipping away, and even though the, the game still finished with a 20-point lead, I can kind of see why Mark Few just let the starters run it all the way out, especially with a couple of days off before the next game. And then my last thing, Dickie V. My God, you guys. Anybody who had the game on before it actual before tip-off, you saw Dick Vitale's initial opportunity to be back behind the mic, and he was very emotional. I mean, he, he was crying. He was so happy to be back. Uh, talking about how he got diagnosed on October 12th, did not think that he would be ever be behind the mic again, calling a basketball game to get the opportunity to do it less than six weeks later uh, for a game like this. He was extremely emotional. I don't know how anybody could have watched that and not gotten emotional themselves. It was an extraordinary thing from a man who has done so much, not just for the game of college basketball, but for for cancer research. I mean, he's raised, I think the, the number that I saw was $44 million 
that he has raised for cancer research. And he's not doing this in response to getting cancer himself. He's been doing this for decades, been doing this for years and years and years. And now, you know, he gets diagnosed with cancer. He fights through it. 82-year-old man. I mean, the, the story that he's back is, is truly incredible. And I was so happy. You know, it was one of the few times I wasn't, I was happy I wasn't at a game because I got to see this, see him be emotional, listen to him call the game. He was so excited. He used the phrase deluxe diaper dandy to talk about Chet Holmgren, which was maybe my favorite phrase of the entire game. He looked fantastic for an 82-year-old man who's just getting over lymphoma. He looked incredible. He sounded the same. It was it was extraordinary. Like I get chills now just talking about it and thinking about him kind of on this journey to come back and be healthy and be ready for this game and to see a game like that. It wasn't a close game. It wasn't an epic game in that regard, but still, I'm so glad that Gonzaga and Mark Few put on a show for him in this one. All right, coming back, third segment, we're going to pivot away from the Gonzaga-UCLA game. We're still going to talk about WCC teams beating up on Pac-12 teams, though. That's still a topic for today's episode because we're going to talk about the rest of the WCC, how they've been doing through Feast Week, how they've been doing throughout the regular season. Before we get there, though, let's talk about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever, plain and simple. It's a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. Built Bar has nine delicious flavors, including some all-time favorites like raspberry, mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, coconut, and my personal favorite, salted caramel. Of course, Built Bar is not only great tasting, they are healthy too. Most Built Bar flavors have 17 grams of protein, 130 calories, and only four grams of sugar. Nine amazing flavors, all tasty and all healthy. Go to BuiltBar.com now and use promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your first order. That's BuiltBar.com, promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off your first order. Today's episode is also brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is back and better than ever. Bet Online has a new web interface for the start of the NBA and college basketball seasons and features more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website today to sign up and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code LOCKEDON to receive your bonus. From basketball, football, baseball postseason, NHL, boxing, UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. All right, welcome back. Segment three, still talking WCC, still talking them winning over the Pac-12. We're no longer discussing Gonzaga's beatdown of UCLA, but we're still going to talk. We're still going to talk WCC versus Pac-12 because that's the big topic is, is the West Coast Conference better than the Pac-12? In a recent episode on Mailbag Monday, I said that I don't think they would finish better than the Pac-12. It's a lot closer now. It's a lot closer. We'll, we'll talk about each team individually. We'll start with BYU. They're the top-ranked team outside of Gonzaga in the conference. They're 18th in the AP poll. They're 27th, according to Ken Palm, 4-0 on the year. They beat the tar out of Oregon. I mean, they pounded Oregon earlier this week. It was an embarrassing performance from the Ducks. BYU, we knew they were good. They already beat San Diego State this year. But to do this to Oregon, a team that was ranked within the top 25. Now, Oregon's struggling. Don't get me wrong, they're probably not a top 25 team. But for BYU to do that and beat them by like 25 points or whatever it was, really kind of showed a light on how good this team is. Right now, according to Ken Palm, they're a top 30 team in the country in both offense and defense. They're an outstanding shooting team. They're led by Alex Barcelo, who's having an incredible season. Not that we're surprised. He's been an incredible player for BYU for the last couple of years. BYU's next big game is against Utah on the 27th of this month. So check that one out if you can. Next up, St. Mary's. They are now 36th, according to Ken Palm, jumped just ahead of USF. They are 6-0 on the year. They, like BYU, also beat up on Oregon. It wasn't quite as, as much of a blowout. I think they ended up winning by 12, but for St. Mary's on the way that they play basketball, double-digit win is pretty darn good because they keep things close to the chest most of the time. They don't allow a lot of points, but they also don't score a lot of points. I believe the final score here was 62-50. to 50. Nice game from St. Mary's. I know that they're the they're not the most fun team to watch play basketball. It's is you have to be kind of into into some ugly basketball if you want to be a fan of the St. Mary's Gales, but but that's winning basketball. They find ways to get it done. Randy Bennett's he's a good coach as much as we may not like him, and that's reasonable, but he is a good coach. He's six and zero on the year. Uh, they snuck a win against Notre Dame. They obviously just beat Oregon. Now they get Wisconsin in the Maui Championship. Most people expected Oregon versus Houston. Instead, we get St. Mary's 
versus Wisconsin, which is going to be a interesting game of basketball. I don't, I don't want to say fun, but it'll be an interesting game of basketball and a chance for St. Mary's to potentially add another really nice win or even a good loss to their resume. Next up, USF. They're also 6-0 on the year. Ken Palm, 38. That's three schools, excuse me, four schools in the WCC that are within the top 40 on Ken Palm's rankings. A truly incredible season that the WCC is putting together. USF is also 6-0, which means between the top four schools, they have Zero losses, excuse me, top five schools. We'll talk about Santa Clara here in a second. Top five schools in the WCC haven't lost a game. San Francisco has wins over Davidson and Nevada. They're a top 46 team in offense and defense per Ken Pomps. So they're a balanced roster. Todd Golden, incredible coach over there at USF, doing some really good stuff. Jamari Bouye, Khalil Shabazz, two excellent scoring guards on that roster. They got UNLV on December 4th, Grand Canyon on the 18th. Two big games coming up for them. Santa Clara, 5-0 on the rec on the season, 71st, according to Ken Palm, a team really on the rise. Probably the surprise team of the season, like of the entire, not just in the WCC, of all of college basketball. This is a team that was expected to be 7th or 8th by some people in the WCC. Not only are they way above that, they're a top 70 team in the country. They destroyed Nevada. They beat Stanford badly, and then they just beat up on TCU without Use of Rankage, their best player by most accounts. P.J. Pipes' transfer guard has been outstanding. Jalen Williams is having a fantastic season. They look like a tournament team. They really do. And you're, you know, 70, top 70 in Ken Palm, like you're right on the edge of what's considered a tournament team now. Will the committee allow this many schools from the WCC to make it? I have no idea. These teams are all going to lose once or twice to Gonzaga. They're probably going to lose to BYU. They might lose to St. Mary's. It makes it a little bit more complicated because – they're all gonna they're all gonna beat up on each other a little bit, but Santa Clara has the resume, uh, or at least they've they've started to build the resume. They have the talent. They could potentially be a tournament team, and I cannot believe I'm saying that in November about this team when it before the season started, I wasn't sure they'd even finish top half in the conference. LMU, a team that most people did expect to finish top half in the conference, a team many people thought would be top three or top four at least. Not doing so great. They're three and two on the year. Kind of a disappointing start. They did get a nice win over Southern Methodist recently, 84th according to Ken Palm. They got smoked by Florida State. They got beat in their opening day by Chattanooga. Bummers, bummer games for them. Not surprising. They lost to Florida State, a team with a ton of length, a ton of size, something that LMU just doesn't really have. Joe Quintana is having a great season for them. Nice to see them rebound. They got Grand Canyon on the 29th of this month. Tulsa on the seventh. Two, two opportunities to pick up some nice wins and kind of start to rebound from a, an ugly start. San Diego's next, 3-2, and two, 159th, according to Ken Palm. Very, very close losses. Very close to being 5-0. and oh. They lost to Cal by 5, lost to Fullerton by 2. They do have a nice win over Nevada, who's been struggling this year, and UC Riverside, their next big game, is against Fresno State on the 1st. Pacific is next, 3-3, three and three, 161st in Ken Palm, so right next to San Diego. They only have one Division One win. It was against Chicago State, so you could argue they have like half a Division One win because Chicago State has basically no budget and is generally considered one of the worst Division One teams in the country. I'm pretty surprised Pacific is this high, according to Ken Palm, when they've they've lost to Hawaii, they lost to Northern Colorado, they lost to UTEP. They haven't beat any Division One schools. Uh, their next big game, according to their schedule, is Cal on December 22nd. Uh, We'll see how this team looks when they start playing some more real competition, but I think it's been a bit of a bummer start uh, for Pacific in the outside the Damon Stoudemire era uh, for the Tigers. Final two teams, Pepperdine, Ken Palm, 203, 2-4 two on the season. Their wins are over Idaho State and UC Davis. They got smoked pretty badly by Rice and UC Irvine. No Colby Ross, no Kessler Edwards. It's a lot harder for this team to be relevant. Uh, you know, you know, losing two generational talents like that, two of the best players in program history, it's going to be hard. To rebound from that, they're kind of hit and miss this year. Some games they look really, really good. Some games they look really, really bad. Their next three games are TCU, Grand Canyon, and Nevada. Even two two wins out of that would be great. Uh, I'm just hoping they get one because that's a tough stretch of games for a really young, ex inexperienced team. And then finally, the Portland Pilots. We're used to the Pilots being last, and they are 307th in Ken Palm, well behind everybody else. But they're 5-1. and one. They're 5-1, and one, and their one loss was to Arizona State, and they were only down six at halftime. I'm, I'm encouraged. I don't know that they're going to get out of the cellar here uh, in the in the WCC. Certainly, Ken Baum does not think that they're uh, nearly as good as the rest of the teams in the conference. But if they're a tough team to grade, the new coach, Shante Leggins, obviously taking over for Terry Porter. A uh, ton of new players. No, no, zero. Zero returning players 
from their who were on the scholarship last year from last year's team. All of them are gone. So it's a brand new team, ton of transfers, a lot of them from Eastern Washington that Shante brought with him when he left that job to come over to UP. Uh, going to be exciting to see what this team looks like. They're they're a multi year project. They're not going to be ready right away, but you know, I, I got to imagine that Palace fans are really happy to see a five and one record next to their name, even if they haven't played a lot of great teams. That's still much better than this team has been doing in years past. Their next big game is against Oregon on the 15th. I think Oregon's probably going to win that one, but they have not had a lot of luck against the WCC so far this season. So we got to look out for that one as well. All right, y'all, it is time for me to sleep nice and soundly after that win over UCLA. I'm sure many of you are going to get a great night's rest as well. Thursday, of course, Andy Locks, we're still going to do it. Uh, you submit your questions to me on Wednesday. I'll record it Wednesday evening. It'll go up on Thursday so you can listen to all of the hot takes that you all have while eating your Thanksgiving dinner. Friday's episode is going to be a preview of the Duke Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson of Locked On Blue Devils. Super excited to have him on the show to talk about Duke and what that game's going to look like. All right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Of course, available wherever you already get podcasts and available on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button for me, please. Try to get us to 200 subscribers before we do take on Mike Krzyzewski's Blue Devils on Friday evening. Links to the podcast will also be available on Twitter at Locked On Zags or on my personal Twitter account, which you can find at ScoreZags Score. Finally, now is a great time to make your second listen of the day, the Locked On Bets podcast. Locked On Bets is your one, your daily one-stop shop for all of your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags!